Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for our meditation this morning comes from our um, Old Testament reading of Deuteronomy 30. It was read a few moments ago from the lectern, Dear Friends in Christ. You know, going to the grocery store can be so stressful. There are so many choices when you go into the grocery store. I can remember back when I was a kid, the options for certain things were somewhat limited, like ice cream. As a kid, I remember there weren't too many options. There was usually chocolate, vanilla, and a few other flavors there that you could have. And then, can you remember that too? Can you remember in the, your younger days going to the store and, and the less options there were? Maybe the, the choices of soup was limited and maybe even the choices of cereal was limited back when you were a kid. But today... There are so many choices, and a visit to the grocery store can almost overwhelm us with that virtual kaleidoscope of choices that are in every aisle that you go down. Take ice cream, for instance. Many brands there. There's Haagen-Dazs, there's Baskin-Robbins, Ben & Jerry, Nestle's, Blue Bunny, and even the store brands, and, and then there's flavors galore in each one of those. Or how about the various creams of? You have cream of chicken, cream of celery, cream of mushroom, cream of asparagus, all those that you use to bind casseroles together. And, or how about all of the other soups in that same aisle that are there that bind you to that shelf interminably trying to choose which soup you really want? Oh, and, and should it be low sodium or regular? What about cereals? All the brands and choices and cereals. And for your morning chocolate fix of those who need chocolate every morning, you have Cocoa Puffs, Cocoa Krispies, um, Count Chocula, and for the leprechaun in you, you even have chocolate um, um, Lucky Charms. The choices are amazing. So many choices that one can, in fact, become overwhelmed when they're shopping just for groceries. A myriad of choices, though, isn't just limited to our shopping experience at the grocery store. Our world today and our society have become a canon of moral choices, if you will. Alternative and optional lifestyles connected with a growing lack of morals introduce a, a catalog of personal choices and individualistic decisions and, that are advocated, that are acceptable and good. And some honestly might be even with, come with the idea and propose that these are, are truly God-given. Except we discover something when we read God's word. God offers only two choices to us. This morning, our text from Deuteronomy 30 clearly states what God has placed before us from verse 15. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. We really don't have too many choices, do we? Our text this morning comes at the end of Moses' farewell words to the Israelite people. He states clearly what will bring blessings and what will bring curses. The choice is pretty simple. Obey God's commandment and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. There is no middle ground whatsoever. And really, that's not a lot of choice when you get down to it. God commands us to make just one choice, really, when you think about it. That's life. Life through the obedience to his commands and his laws. We must ask ourselves why this is so important. It says elsewhere in Deuteronomy here, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. The Lord will establish you as a people holy to himself, as he has sworn to you, if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. The laws and the commands of God delivered to Israel were the means through which they were able then to be a light to all of the nations out there and a witness that would draw a whole lot of other nations into them so that they too could learn of the one true God. God's commands are still the means through which his people today, you and I, displays their, display their peculiarity and reflect the uniqueness of the one true God. When we tell our friends, sure, we look forward to meeting you at the lake right after we're done with church on Sunday morning. They'll know we worship a different God than the God of fishing or watering. We help them understand what our true priority is in life. 
When our language and our jokes are clean, when we tactfully change the conversation away from gossip and slander about someone, people will know that we are different. When we speak lovingly about our spouses and our children, instead of saying those phrases you sometimes hear, yeah, you know how wives can be, or you know how husbands can be, or you know how children are today. When we change away from those conversations, folks will see how much one values their spouse and their children. God still requires obedience to his commandments so that we might continue to be a light to all the world. Moses speaks an exhortation in verse 11 that comes just a little bit before our text. Moses says this to the Israelites, for this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you. We know that our sinful nature, our sinful flesh finds itself at war with God's commandments. The law of God is a burden to sinful man and it creates an in, in, inward struggle that oftentimes causes us then to be lured off into the wrong direction and sometimes lured off in a lot of wrong directions. It's hard for us to keep his commandments. The commandments God gave to Israel were much more than just 10 rules. He gave a whole bunch of other ones. God outlined for Israel the manner to which they were to live in every aspect of life. He gave laws about property rights. He gave laws about being a witness, laws about warfare and laws about unsolved murder, inheritance rights, rebellious children, sexual immorality, laws about uncleanness, laws about divorce, and a whole bunch of other miscellaneous laws that he put out there for the Israelites and, and how they were supposed to live in every aspect. And these commands are not supposed to be burdensome, Really? It was tough for them. It's tough for us. Well, what God requires of us, he actually produces inside each and every one of us. From verse 6, a little bit earlier in chapter 30, proclaims this, the good news. It says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. Part of the good news here in Deuteronomy chapter 30 is that God doesn't say to each and every one of us, you circumcise your own heart, or you do the radical regeneration and the spiritual renewal of your heart, as though he's called each and every one of us to accomplish the required change of our hearts through our own efforts and actions. God doesn't do that. God isn't leaving the choice up to us, you see. The one acceptable choice he, in fact, makes for us by himself. He makes the choice for us, and that's the radical work of regeneration of our hearts. This verse clearly explains, then, that God will accomplish that which he requires of us. He makes the change. What great news that is. What a great gospel message that is for us, a sinful people. God does the changing. Left to our sinful self then, our sinful nature, we can't obey the commandments of the Lord at all. Yet he will cut off the hardness of our hearts and produce in us a longing and a loving attitude to do his will and to obey his commandments. How will he do this? God changes the hearts of people to do his will by continually and repeatingly loving them in the midst of their sinfulness and rejections. That is by showing his mercy, his grace, and his forgiveness to a rebellious people. He did that to a rebellious people of Israel, and he does it to us, a rebellious people today. God reveals in his word the reason for his mercy and grace for his rebellious people when he sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross. Jesus' atonement for the sins of all people is the reason we are delivered then from God's just punishment. And as we begin to wrap up our Epiphany season with this the last Sunday of Epiphany and next week the Transfiguration, we quickly turn into the season of Lent where we remember the love God had for us in sending his son Jesus. And we remember the love Jesus had for us willingly going to that cross to die for the sins of all people. The power God gives us to choose life 
and to obey his commandments is so very near us. The grace and mercy that brings about such a change in our heart is offered to us through the word of God and through the sacraments which deliver Jesus Christ and his forgiveness to us. These means of grace, which are not our choice really, do enable us to live faithfully then in obedience to him and his word. In holy baptism, God circumcised through the radical work of regeneration, washing away the hardness that exists because of original sin and creating in us new people. Each one of us has created a new person formed and fashioned in the likeness of Jesus Christ. And God fills us with the power then to put to death every day the old nature in us and allow that new nature, that new person within us to come forth equipped to live and to serve him according to his will. The obedience that comes through faith is the loving desire to do God's will and obey his commandments. Not because it's a way for us to earn righteousness, but because they are a display of righteousness we have already been given by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Obedience, then, is our way to display a loving response to him who loved us in Christ Jesus. Because we are equipped through word and sacrament, then, we can go forth into a world of temptations and testings and moral imbalance with so many evil choices out there, fully capable of making the one right choice between the two paths. We don't have and don't want any other choices. We choose to obey God's voice to us, follow him, and turn away from the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. As we continue then to gather around God's word and sacraments, we will be glad to choose life and to offer to the world new life now and eternal life in the age to come. Choose life. Amen.